What we're about to hear is the result of, or a preliminary report on an experiment that came out of discussions at this very conference. Um, burglary being something that uh, creates victims. And one of the leading victims uh, experts interviewed more burglary victims, uh, I suspect, than anybody else in the room, is Dr. Heather Strang, Deputy Director of the Cambridge Police Executive Program. Please welcome your program chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is indeed a great pleasure to uh, chair this session, uh, not least because one of the great uh, delights, actually, of being involved in the police executive program uh, that so many of you are students in or who have graduated <coughs> from um, is this wonderful uh, synergy that we're able to create between uh, what our students are interested in and the research that they're capable of doing based on the knowledge that they've acquired in the course uh, of uh, the Police Executive Program uh, Master's course. Um, uh, that knowledge, combined with the opportunities that they have um, as senior officers in their own forces, has created some uh, really wonderful research. And it's uh, really very nice uh, for me to chair a session with two of our very best graduates, I think. Um, uh, Alex and Chris uh, have, uh, have both done stellar work, um, uh, we like to think, as a consequence of their, uh, their studies here at, uh, at Cambridge. And uh, we're going to hear from, uh, from Alex Murray first, and then from Chris Rowley, together with uh, Dr. Catherine Muller-Johnson, who was Chris's supervisor um, for the, uh, the thesis that came out of this piece of work, and they'll be uh, co-presenting um, later on. Um, but uh, I think that uh, uh, Chief and uh, Superintendent Alex Murray needs little introduction, certainly none to the very strong West Mids contingent here today. Um, and uh, he is going to talk about uh, an experiment underway in... Uh, Birmingham, uh, which really has as uh, some of its objectives the sort of um, uh, objectives that uh, are coming out of the uh, Leeds study as well that, uh, that Chris Rowley is managing. Um, they have slightly different approaches, they have slightly different methodologies, uh, but it's all in the cause of burglary reduction, and so without further ado, uh, Alex. Thanks very much, Heather, and thanks very much, Larry, for inviting me this afternoon. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on a really hot, sunny day. It's really nice to see all the, the flags at the back, and in true English-British form, I see in the hot weather the Union flag's all droopy, <laughs> but not as, not as droopy as the Australian one that's nearly fallen down. So, I'm going to talk a bit about some theory, then methods, then results and then theory and methods again as we move into uh, the second experiment. But as Larry said, a couple of years ago I was sitting in the audience here and Shane Johnson from University College London stuck up this picture and it really struck home with me because I think it's a really impactive picture. And I apologise for those who've seen it before, but I took it back. Uh, we made some tactical decisions uh, in East Birmingham as a result of seeing this. And basically what it shows is a picture format, and I've got some wonderful technology here, of... A house that's burgled, and we can see that uh, the number of burglaries, think this was taken from Merseyside data, um, you can see the vulnerability for the blue line at the top here is within one week, and you can see that the vulnerability is highest on the house that's burgled within the first week, but the neighbours are, are very high, and Shane Johnson called this concept near repeat burglaries, and the neighbours' neighbours are also high, as are the neighbours' neighbours' neighbours. And what we can see is that the vulnerability is highest within the first week, but that in just two weeks, the vulnerability drops this low. So for practitioners, it's really important that we put our police officers in the right place at the right time, but really quickly. It's no point looking at a couple of months' data and saying that's your burglary hotspot if this data is to be uh, believed. Uh, and this, again, was UCL's qualitative insight into that quantitative analysis, where they did interviews with burglary suspects that explained... Uh, the behaviour that we saw uh, in that graph. 
and I, I don't need to read it out to you, you can see it there. But they basically say, I go in, I hit a place, if it gets on top, I move on. And I need to do it within a couple of days because the police get, catch on with the game and they'll come in quickly. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, um, I approached Shane and said, that's great stuff, I, I'd like to use it, and I'd like to see if we can do something in Birmingham, preferably across the whole of Birmingham, um, to test this assertion. So here's some Birmingham data here. We got rid of distraction burglaries. Uh, these are the total amount of burglaries over three years in Birmingham, 17,000. And when they did their near repeat and repeat analysis, they came up with a similar concept that was found in Merseyside. Basically, uh, those houses that are repeats uh, are within seven days and 100 metres are most likely to be victims of either repeat burglaries or near repeat burglaries. This is a Knox analysis that basically means if we look here, compared to what would be a routine distribution, I believe, of 100, within 21 days and 100 metres, if there is uh, 100 burglaries normally, there would be 136 in this area. So it shows that you need to focus in less than seven days, in less than 100 metres, where the highest risk of burglary is. This is using the Birmingham data. If you then break it down into wards, uh, these are some of the wards in Birmingham that were analysed. You've got the total burglary over three years in those wards. Sally Oak, as many of you may know, is a student area. And you can see here that up to 37% of burglaries in Sally Oak were constituted as repeats or near repeats. Now, Sally Oak uh, is a student area, so many multi-occupancy dwellings, but somewhere like so uh, Soho, 28%. So as an operational commander, you're thinking, well, I can potentially make an impact if I can eliminate or reduce repeats and near repeats by putting the right officers in the right place at the right time by something up to those percentages, in theory. Uh, and some of the detection data uh, that's also given to Shane, and, and this was uh, published by them in 2009... Uh, showed that, indeed, if you look at all burglaries that are detected, if they're within 100 metres and 14 days of each other, 76% are cleared to the same offender. Uh, it's not the same if you look at 112 days. So, for Swordfish Part 1, which is the results I'm going to feed in today, uh, we wanted to do a number of things. We wanted to target harden repeat victims and near-repeat addresses. So, uh, there would be a trigger event, a burglary, we put in target hardening at the burgled premises and the neighbours. We also wanted then, as we've got officers doing that, to give advice based on MOs. And previously, we weren't very good at this. We would say, there's been a burglary in your area. Can you watch out? This one, we wanted to be a lot more specific to empower the citizens. We wanted to say, that house over there is the one that's been burgled. They got in through the lower door panel, uh, and this is what they stole. And here's neighbourhood watch, and can you sign up? Uh, one thing we didn't do, and we didn't combine it with, which I know Chris is, I believe, going to talk to you from a Yorkshire point of, point of view, is the high-vis patrol. So we had PCSOs and PCs delivering this tactic. Uh, that in itself would be reasonably high-vis, but there was no specific high-vis patrol in that area. So it was very much a test of the target hardening equipment and the advice. And this is the way we did it. We did a gold, silver, bronze approach... Uh, the gold house was the burglary, uh, the initial burglary. That was the trigger point. Two silvers and two bronzes. The gold got about £20 uh, pounds worth of target hardening equipment. The silvers uh, around £10 to £12 pounds, and the bronze around £4 to £5. Pounds. That consisted of, uh, for the gold, window alarms, door alarms, very cheap, um, a fake television you could put behind the net curtain that makes it look like the television's on inside, uh, and that amount of equipment reduced as vulnerability reduced from gold, silver, bronze. We also gave everybody a sticker of uh, Rottweiler or an Alsatian to stick on the door, uh, trying to go along the deterrent approach. Now, a lot of this work was built uh, on some stuff that GMP uh, led on uh, many years ago, firstly as a result of seeing some of the Shane Johnson and Kate Bower's work, where they showed that in Trafford they... They did a sort of quasi-experiment. They, they had a huge impact on burglary by throwing everything into areas of concentric circles highlighted by this near-repeat phenomenon. Uh, and they showed uh, significant reductions uh, in burglary compared to GMP as a, as a whole and the most similar group. Uh, and we wanted to do something similar and we wanted to have some really uh, good methodology so we could say this tactic does or doesn't work. 
<laughs> that, that equipment, by the way, cost us £120,000. Cost the Community Safety Partnership £120,000. They were prepared to invest in it. But you've got to ask the question, £120,000 every year, is it worth it? Uh, and I need some really good evidence, if it is worth it, um, to get that money again and again and again. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember... Uh, sitting in your office, Larry, with Shane and me for four hours trying to work through the methodology that would be most appropriate to test this type uh, of approach. And initially, for example, we wanted, we wanted to put the high-vis patrol with the target hardening, uh, and Larry rightly hi highlighted that you'd have a problem when you got the results around understanding, well, was it about target hardening or was it about high-visibility patrol? And, and he suggested splitting the experiment into two phases, which is, in fact, what we did. We also had a debate around, OK, what's the methodology we're going to use? Uh, we had a, a block randomization methodology, which in effect was the one we went with in the end, where in Birmingham there's 46 wards, uh, natural wards, political, uh, political boundaries, uh, and we paired those uh, in burglary rates. So 46, 23 pairs matching burglary rates, and then we randomly allocated them into test or control groups. Um, but we had a problem with that because often test and control groups would be neighbouring each other. And as many of you out there who are criminologists will be aware, you have issues around displacement or diffusion of benefit. So if I put a load of offices into a particular area, is the benefit of their presence uh, going to displace crime or is it actually going to diffuse and, and uh, improve what would be control areas? So we instituted these sterile corridors that are about, they're in green here, 200 yards uh, across where we would not analyse the data. So all the data you're going to see today is from the blue or the pink areas, the test or control areas, to try and negate the, uh, the accusations of displacement or diffusion of benefit. We looked at other, other methodologies, uh, the possibility of treating each burglary as a, a trigger event and randomising that and saying, OK, there's a burglary, do we random, do randomly allocate that into protection or not? Um, the problem with that uh, is that you have an issue with uh, what happens when there's another trigger event very close by. Uh, and you develop then uh, a bit of a conflict of interest where you say, well, do I deliver the target hardening to that one or not because it looks like a near repeat? Is it an actual trigger event? And it got a little bit complex. So we worked on a third design, which was referred to as the nested design, where you still have the wards in test and control areas, but in the test areas, you then randomly allocate the burglary to receive target hardening or not. But the problem still remains with what happens if you have a near repeat. Uh, what do you constitute that second burglary as? Uh, it got a little complex, and in the end, we decided to go with the basic design that I described to begin with, which is 43 test and control areas. That would then give us a measure of, do, we, do I affect the total burglary rate between test and control group, uh, and can I affect the survivability of the property? So how long it can be protected from repeat victimisation or near repeat victimisation? <laughs> Uh, and we've come to an end of that experiment. Nearly 14,000 uh, houses have received some form of uh, treatment, which is great. Uh, and this is what we've ended up with. Uh, and these results came in on Friday, so it's hot off the press. Um, first thing to say, uh, and it kills me when I get results like this, there's a slight trend, but it's not statistically significant, as far as burglary reduction is concerned, total burglary reduction between test and control. So a lot of effort, a lot of patrol time, and a lot of target hardening equipment has gone on, but have I affected the total burglary rate between test and control group? Not at the moment. There's some more research going on at the moment to say, well, what about in those high-volume wards, the medium-volume wards, and the low-volume wards? If you just look at test and control groups in those areas, what do you think? Uh, and we'll find out about that. Uh, shortly. But when you look at survivability of property, it gets a little more interesting. So here we have the green line being test, the blue line control, uh, and using a statistical method, they looked at the probability of survive, uh, survival of the properties. Uh, so these are the target premises and then their neighbours across time. And you can see that the areas that uh, received the treatment survived repeat victimisation uh, for longer uh, and in a safer way than in the control group. It gets a little more interesting, though, 
Because when we look at gold properties, i.e. those properties that were burgled and received the most equipment, uh, we see the difference increases. So the protection lasts for longer in those properties. And it gets a little more interesting because officers go out again and again and again. And our officers, we said, go out three times uh, and after three times, give up and just tell us that you haven't managed to install the equipment. Uh, and we see for when you look at just gold properties that are successfully installed, you see a, a bigger difference. So what this is telling us is that as far as the victim is concerned, the equipment and the advice seems to have an effect where they are protected for longer. But this is just gold property. So this is single premises that have been burgled. Uh, and we have an interesting drop-off after about five months' time here. And so there's a question about why is there this drop-off? Is it around data or is it around people not using the equipment? Uh, interestingly, when we did some dip sampling, uh, only about 40% of properties had the dog stickers up because a lot of people didn't want the dog stickers up. So that, that played into it as well. If we just go back to that. <coughs> if we look at the difference here, what does that actually mean? That probably means about 240 premises that were in the control group that were subject to repeat victimisation or repeat burglary. Uh, compared to the control group. But that raises more interesting questions. If we then look at silver properties, uh, we see again a difference uh, successfully installed, but we don't see the five-month drop-off. Now, that, <coughs> that's interesting for me because the amount of silver properties were four times as many as the burglaries because we did two either side of the gold properties. So we have much more data for that. Many more houses were target-hardened, which makes me think, is there something around the amount of data in the gold cohort that is different to the silver. And bronze the same, and you can see that there's a difference between test and control. The way we worked this out, by the way, was uh, we ran a simulation in the control areas of all the premises that were burgled, uh, and we ran, uh, uh, we ran the analysis to say, okay, you were burgled. Um, if you'd been target-hardened, uh, would you have been a, the subject of a, a repeat victimisation or not? OK, so that's, uh, that's the results, uh, early stage. Um, an interesting question is, uh, because there was not a net difference, but there was a significant difference in survival probability, this is significant, by the way, 0.04 as far as the p-value is concerned, um, <clears throat> what's happened to the total burglary rates? Because they're surviving longer but the burglary rates haven't changed between test and control, at least not in a statistically significant way. So we're running another analysis at the moment on the properties either side of the bronze to test the sort of displacement theory. So did the burglar walk past the target-hardened houses and the houses with the dog stickers on until they, he or she came to an area where uh, there were no dog stickers and then had a displacement effect? That's something we'll be having a look at. OK, so then we're moving into... Phase two. So that's, that's the end of phase one. Loads more analysis to be done. <coughs> a lot more data cleansing to be done. Uh, and I need to understand better some of these findings. But as I said, I've only had this, these findings around 48 hours. Phase two gets a little more interesting then. And uh, hopefully with uh, West Yorkshire and Chris, we'll run phase two in Leeds and Birmingham. It's something both our ACPO groups need to uh, agree first. And phase two, we're planning to look at total crime rates for public place crime, so theft from motor vehicle, robbery, criminal damage to motor vehicle, and burglary. And we want to test this whole concept of predictive policing. Uh, can you put police officers in places where uh, crime is about to happen? It's quite... The media love this stuff. It's yet really unevidenced in a, in a really useful and tried and tested way. <coughs> So, we're going to combine three methods of prediction into one uh, to create uh, a method of predicting which street segments to put police officers in to try and reduce total public place crime. And those three areas are these three. Uh, the first one is a concept that, again, Shane, Johnson and Kate Bowers have named between this. Um, just to appreciate probably the Chatham House wall at the moment as this is subject to review and will be published in the not-too-distant future. 
But they'd already done some research as far as the permeability of streets is concerned. Quite an interesting concept <clears throat> where they say, if you can classify roads by how many junctions there are in them, and if you can imagine a junction as a whole, the more porous or the more permeable it becomes, how does that change the vulnerability? And they spent ages classifying different road segments as main roads, minor roads, local roads, linear cul-de-sacs, i.e. they go in a straight line, or sinuous cul-de-sacs, they're slightly curvy. <clears throat> and indeed, they did find a strong relationship that um, the main roads are the most vulnerable and the sinuous cul-de-sacs are the lowest vulnerable. And so when you're thinking now as a police commander, I've got a nice big red, round, juicy hotspot, I'm going to fill it with cops. Actually, you can be a bit, little bit smarter than that and you can say, I'm actually going to put the cops in only these parts of the hotspot because they're potentially the most vulnerable. And indeed, if you run this for Birmingham, as we've done, uh, it's replicated here. So rate of... This is just for burglary, by the way, though. This is rate of burglary per 1,000 households per annum, and you can see uh, a correlation. It's not massive, uh, but there is one there. Local street compared to A Road, for example, quite a, quite a big difference. This is going to become slightly more advanced with the development of uh, a mathematical concept called graph theory. Uh, now, at this uh, point in time, road segments were manually classified as A, B, sinuous or straight. Um, there is another concept uh, which has been labelled between this, where you can automate how vulnerable a street segment is. And the way I'd describe it is as this. If you were travelling from here to the Eagle... Uh, how many street segments would you travel through to get to the Eagle? And a street segment you'd classify as a network point between two junctions. So as you walked to the Eagle, you'd give one point to each street segment you went to. If you then decided, OK, I'm going to go to the Red Lion, you go from here to the Red Lion, and you again give a point to each street segment you go through. Now, some of those street segments you might have gone through twice, so they'll have two points rather than one point. Now, if you can imagine a computer simulation doing that, but from here to every other single point across the whole of Cambridge, so uh, millions of computations, and then giving one point to each street segment. And then if you can imagine going to another street segment and doing it from there to every other street segment across the whole of Cambridge, and then doing it for every single street segment across the whole of Cambridge, going to every other street segment, what you would find, uh, and graph theory will tell us, is that some street segments will have many, many points, and some will just have a few points. Um, and you can codify that and give it a score of 1 to 10, and that's exactly what the Jordando Institute have done. Uh, and they've found, uh, in line with their initial findings around the permeability of roads, that there is a direct correlation between the scoring of betweenness and the vulnerability to burglary. Uh, and so that's the first way of predicting where crime can happen in the future. The second one is what I've called historical observed relationships here. And I've got a screen dump of PredPol here. PredPol is the stuff that <coughs> the Americans uh, are, are selling. Uh, it's a business. Uh, and it basically takes as much data as you can throw at it, uh, so five, ten years' data, and looks at the relationships <coughs> around patterns of behaviour in whatever the place is. So if I gave them all Birmingham's data, you'd say... You'd crunch it, use a statistical model that's been used before. They, you, you can predict earthquakes with it. You can predict where IEDs are in Iraq. It's been used in all manner of areas. And you can say, from looking at the relationship between all these variables, all these burglaries, you can come up with understanding around how burglary works, how patterns evolve. And you can say, based on that previous behaviour, we can predict future behaviour. Uh, and that's what PredPol does. Kent have had some great success with PredPol. PredPol is beaten their analysts. Their analysts have managed to predict uh, about 5% of crime using their techniques. PredPol automated can predict around 8%, and we, we learnt on Friday that they've had some good results with that. But also, detection data, and we're throwing this into the pot as well, where we're giving all the detection data, we already have given the detection data to the Gildando Institute, and they can say, OK, let's look at offender. Where do they live and where did they commit their crime? And what can we understand from the relationship around how offenders move? So what that gives us, then, is a Venn diagram, three pieces of predictive sources of information that you can combine together to make a really nuanced, hopefully reasonably powerful tool that looks at historical relationships, the betweenness concept, the permeability of streets, and the detection data. Put it all together in a single algorithm 
and it should predict street segments where you say, okay, this is the place to put my PCSO or my police officer to make an impact. And you'll see from <coughs> Leeds, just using the historical data concept, and you've seen it from GMP, uh, that you can actually make a, a really significant difference. And Chris will move on to that in an area. And what I'm hoping is that by adding in the betweenness concept and the detection data, you can multiply the effect and the effectiveness of that uh, predictive tool. And uh, just going back to this slide, really, uh, and the reason why I'm raising it again is foraging, and it's something that I heard Professor Sherman say the other day, which, being a very rationalist thinker that you are, uh, you said, I do believe in serendipity, and um, you said that in Wolverhampton, didn't you? And, and we've given all the detection data to UCL, uh, and as a result of that, they've done some of their own analysis um, around the whole foraging concept. Uh, and again, probably some Chatham House walls, but they've they found some very interesting movement patterns on how offenders uh, behave and how they move from one crime hotspot to another. And in a nutshell, you could call it hops and leaps, where they can say, in many areas, you can see crime criminals just hopping from one area to the other, very small spaces where they go uh, from one place to another. And it's very similar to the foraging concept, where in animals move from one place to the other. But then leaps, they notice that in some crime types, when you look at all the detection data, people commit crime in one area, and then they leap probably over 10 hops to another area and commit a load of crime there as well. Uh, and in actual fact, that's been noticed in the foraging literature as well around um, how animals operate. So they, uh, I guess what I'm saying with this point is uh, that by sharing data uh, around trying to predict burglary, you can actually find out all sorts of other useful information, and there's powerful partnerships to be had with institutions like Cambridge, like the Jill Dando Institute, or like um, the University of Wales, for example. We do a lot of uh, work with UPSI. Um, there's real benefits with sharing data. So uh, that's where I'm going to end now, and I'm going to hand over to Chris.